Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is allegedly a letter written by Pontius Pilate to Caesar concerning Jesus and the crucifixion. Now, I'm not saying I believe this. Now, I'm not saying I don't. That's for you to make up your own mind. However, I tried to disprove this, and I did not find any discrepancies in it. I've read it before, and you got to realize something. Translators might, you know, use different words. And I've read this before, and I'm not sure if it was the same people who translated it, but I just read it recently because somebody sent it to me. And this time it seemed to come alive. So if this is a fraud, this was written by somebody with a, 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 a lot of knowledge of history and of the Bible. And I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to make a, a note, remember something here, because I'll go back to it later. Because it mentions a number of things that are just not common knowledge. I mean, the people that own the history uh, books, well, the media and the history books, they've been deleting our history. Totally deleting it. Like uh, there was a country, uh, actually an empire, kingdom called Parthia, P-A-R-T-H-I-A, -A, if I, I'll have to look it up, but it's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Acts, Parthia. And I only found out about it probably less than a year or two ago. And they were contemporaries with Rome. Matter of fact, Rome tried to conquer them and couldn't do it. Matter of fact, Parthia kicked Rome's behind a few times. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it was probably the wise men who went to see Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem, you know, that presented him gold and frankincense and myrrh, were probably Parthians because Par Parthia is from um the east so i don't know so without talking too much and if you want to get the uh read it yourself you can uh, i'll leave the link so that you can uh, see the actual website so it's called historic letter written by pontius pilate to tiberius caesar the ancient bridge, courtesy less visible, I have in my possession a copy of the letter written by Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar, Emperor of Rome. This historic letter written by Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar letter is from the ARCH, Archco, KO, ARCH, KO, Archco volume containing manuscripts in Constantinople. Now, Constantinople, um, was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, it was in Greece. Today it is Turkey. It is uh, Istanbul. So, and the records of the senatorial docket taken from the library at Rome, translated by Drs. McIntosh and Twyman, T W Y M A N, of the Antiquarian Lodge, uh, I wonder if that's a Masonic Lodge, Genoa, Italy. This has been checked and is in accord with the copy of the original lodged in uh, let's see, lodged in where? Oh, the British Museum which was which has verified the accuracy of the transcription. 
Okay, historic letter, resurrect, uh, resurrected Pilate's lengthy letter to Tiberius Caesar discusses at length the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And let's read the letter. Tiberius Caesar, Emperor of Rome, Noble Sovereign, Greeting. The events of the past few days in my province have of such a character that I will give the details in full as they occurred, as I should not be surprised if, in the course of time, they may change the destiny of our nation. For it seems of late that all the gods have ceased to be propitious. Webster's 1828 says, Propitious, favorable, kind, applied to men, disposed to be gracious or merciful, ready to forgive sins, and bestowed blessings applied to God. Favorable. So, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go back. Uh, let's see. Uh, they may change the destiny of our nation, for it seems of late that all the gods have ceased to be propitious. I am almost ready to say, Cursed be the day that I succeeded Valerius, Valerius Falcius in the government of Judea. For since then my life has been one of continual uneasiness and distress. So I guess Pontius Pilate probably replaces Valerius Falcius or whatever. I told you I, I I didn't take Latin in college, so sorry. Uh, let's see. On my arrival at Jerusalem, I took possession of the Praetorium. Uh, Praetorium. The Praetorium is the uh, governor's residence. Okay, so let's keep reading. Upon my arrival in Jerusalem, I took possession of the Praetorium and ordered a splendid feast to be prepared, to which I invited the Tetrarch of Galilee. Uh, and if you remember, uh, the Tetrarch was the ruler of Galilee, and in the time of Jesus, that was Herod. I invited the Tetrarch of Galilee with the high priest and his officers. At the appointed hour, no guest appeared. This I considered an insult, offered my dignity and the whole government which I respect, uh, represent. A few days later, the high priest designed to pay me a visit. His deportment was grave and deceitful. He pretended that... All right, so his deportment was grave and deceitful. He pretended that his religion forbade him and his attendants to sit at the table of the Romans and to eat and offer libations with them. But this was only a sanctimonious seeming for his very countenance betrayed his hypocrisy. Although I found it expedient to accept his excuse for that moment, I was convinced that the conquered had declared themselves the enemy of the conquerors. And I would warn the Romans to beware of the high priests of this country. They would betray their own mother to gain office and a luxurious living. It seems to me that of conquered cities, Jerusalem is the most difficult to govern. So turbulent are the people that I live in momentary dread of an insurrection. I have not soldiers sufficient to suppress it. I had only one centurion and a hundred men at my command. I requested a reinforcement from the prefect of Syria, who informed me that he had scarcely troops sufficient to defend his own province. An insatiable thirst for conquest to extend our empire beyond the means of defending it, I fear, will be the cause of the final overthrow of our whole government. I live secluded from the masses, for I do not know what those 
high priest might influence the rabble to do. Yet I endeavored to ascertain as far as I could the mind and standing of the people. So how do you like that? Um, the high priest and his rabble decided to not show up for this feast with uh, Pilate because, hey, we're holier than thou. We can't sit with you. You would defile us, you know? And trust me, this was uh, not lost on Pilate. Pilate was no friend of those people. Let me tell you something. All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, let's see. I was told it was Jesus among the various rumors that came to my ears that there was one in particular that attracted my attention. A young man, it was said, appeared in Galilee preaching with a noble unction a new law in the name of God who had sent him. Hmm. At first I was apprehensive that his design was to stir up the people against the Romans. But my fears were soon dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth spoke rather as a friend of the Romans rather than of the Jews. One day in passing by the place of Siloa, where there was a great concourse of people, I observed in the midst of the group a young man who was leaning against a tree, calmly addressing the multitude. I was told it was Jesus. This I could easily have suspected, so great was the difference between him and those listening to him. Listen carefully. His golden colored hair and beard. His golden colored hair and beard gave him the appearance of a celestial aspect. He appeared to be about 30 years old. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance. What a contrast between him and his hearers with their black beards and tawny complexion. Unwilling to interrupt him by my presence, I continued to walk, but signified to my secretary to join the group and listen. Bob's note here. You better believe that when somebody's drawing crowds large crowds of thousands of people that the government's going to send spies to listen to what is being said. Unwilling to interrupt him by my presence, I continued to walk, but signified to my secretary to join the group and listen. My secretary's name is Manlius, uh, M-A-N-L-I-U-S. He is the grandson of the chief of the conspirators who encamped in E-T-U-R-I-A, Etruria, I don't know, waiting for Cataline. Man Lewis had been for a long time an inhabitant of Judea and is well acquainted with the Hebrew language. He was devoted to me and worthy of my confidence. On entering the Praetorium, I found Man Lewis, who related to me the words Jesus had pronounced at Siloa. Never had I read in the works of the philosophers anything that can compare to the maxims of Jesus. One of the rebellious Jews, so numerous in Jerusalem, having asked Jesus if it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? Now, this is right out of the Bible, people. He replied, Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. 
Yeah, where have I read that before? All right, let's take a break real quick. Matthew 22, verse 15. Then with the Pharisees. Now, if you don't know what the Pharisees were, they were a denomination of the Jews. Then with the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. In other words, they're going to use his words against him in the uh, against him with law. You know, that's why a lot of defense attorneys will tell you, don't talk to the police. Because if you make a mistake or, you know, you say, well, I wasn't there on, you know, uh, and you say Wednesday, but really it was Tuesday, they'll say, oh, well, he lied to us. Or maybe the cop will make a mistake and thought, oh, he said Wednesday, but I, you know, uh, he'll write, he wrote down Tuesday or something. You know, so the police can make a mistake, you can make a mistake, perfectly honest, but they'll use that against you and say, oh, he lied. And then use that to discredit everything you have to say. That's why they say, don't talk to the police. Um, there's a guy named Dwayne James. You should listen to him. Then with the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent unto him their disciples with the Herodians, Herod's people, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Oh yeah, let's butter him up. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So do we pay our taxes to the evil Roman government? Jesus, what do you think? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Yeah, why are you trying to trick me, you lying hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? You know, whose image is on here? And whose writing is on this coin? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Oh, yeah. Uh, trying to trick Jesus. Not a very good, uh, it's not a very good plan, if you ask me. So, so let's go back to letter. One of the rebellious Jews so numerous in Jerusalem, having asked Jesus if it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar, he replied, Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. I extended unto him my protection. So Pilate actually extended protection to Jesus. So let's read. It was on account of his sayings that I granted so much liberty to the Nazarene, for it was in my power to have him arrested and exiled to Pontus, but that would have been contrary to the justice which has always characterized the Roman government in all its dealings with men. This man was neither seditious nor rebellious. I extended to him my protection, unknown perhaps to himself. He was at liberty to act to speak, to assemble, and address the people, and to choose disciples, unrestrained by any Praetorian mandate. Should it ever happen, may the gods avert the omen, should it ever happen, I say that the religion of our forefathers will be supplanted by the religion of Jesus, it will be to this noble toleration that Rome shall owe her premature death while I, miserable wretch, will have been the instrument of what the Jews call providence and what uh, and we call destiny. 
This unlimited freedom granted to Jesus provoked the Jews, not the poor, but the rich and powerful. It is true that Jesus was severe on the latter, and this was a political reason, in my opinion, for not restraining the liberty of the Nazarene. Scribes and Pharisees, he would say to them, you are a race of vipers. You resemble painted sepulchers. You appear well unto men, but you have death within you. At other times, he would sneer at the alms of the rich and proud, telling them that the might of the poor was more precious in the sight of God. I'm telling you people, Bob's note here, I'm telling you people, whoever wrote this, if this is a fraud, I can't, I, I've been looking, I've been trying to disprove this, and I, I don't know. I'm telling you, it looks pretty rare, so, real. All right, let's keep reading. Complaints were daily made at the Praetorium against the insolence of Jesus. Uh, let me guess who was there complaining. Not the Romans. So, all right. Continue. I was even informed that some misfortune would befall him, that it would not be the first time that Jerusalem had stoned those who called themselves prophets. An appeal would be made to Caesar. However, my conduct was approved by the Senate, and I was promised a reinforcement after the termination of the Parthian War. Hmm. The Parthian War. I'm going to go back to that. Probably. Because, uh, well, maybe I'll do it now. All right, let's take a look at the Bible real quick. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. See, they were scattered. They were scattered. Israel and Judah were scattered. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They weren't doing gibberish. It wasn't, you know, slithering around on the floor like a Pentecostal church. Sorry, Charlie. Only the best tuna gets to be star kissed. No. Tongues was languages. It wasn't gibberish. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? See, the Galileans were not educated you know they sort of like how northerners consider southerners a bunch of uneducated hicks and by the way i was born in the south so you know am i picking on the southerners no my home state was part of the confederacy by the way so and how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. Parthians. Did you catch that? Parthians. There were people from Parthia here in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, 
that was Babylon, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, P-H-R-Y-G-I-A, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. See, people? Parthians. The uh, Parthian Empire, uh, believe it or not, was, uh, well, when you read about basically the area and people of what would become Parthia, before it was called Parthia, it was called Persia. You know, when you read the uh, book of Daniel at the end, it was Persia that conquered Babylon. And when you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was the Persians that allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem. Well, Persia became Parthia, and Parthia is modern-day Iran. And all my research points that they were Scythians who were tied in with the dispersed Israelites of Jeremiah 3 and verse 8 and Jeremiah 31, 31. So it's amazing. I went to college for two years, went to high school, studied history. I read history books, never heard of Parthia, never. They were just as much a powerful empire as Rome. Rome tried to conquer Parthia, and they couldn't do it. They got their butts whipped. Matter of fact, um, some accounts of history records that uh, the three wise men were Parthians who went to see Jesus, and they weren't just three wise men. They had a armored, I mean, an armed uh, troop with them. Uh, probably thousands of troops. And that's why Herod was very, very careful when he was talking to the three wise men. You know, he didn't say, uh, he didn't, he didn't give them any problems, probably because there's a couple thousand troops outside his door waiting for these guys to come out. And if, uh, Pilate's letter is correct. Uh, Rome was stretched thin. So when a, probably a couple thousand Parthians show up on your doorstep, you're like, uh, maybe we should be nice to these guys, you know. But, uh, you know, hey, what do I know? But Rome and Parthia had a bunch of conflicts. You could read it. Look it up. Look it up. It's just amazing that our history, how it's been changed. All right, so, however my conduct was approved by the Senate, I was promised a reinforcement after the termination of the Parthian War. Being too weak to suppress an insurrection, I resolved upon adopting a measure that promised to restore the tranquility of the city without subjecting the praetorium to humiliating concession. I wrote to Jesus requesting an interview with him at the praetorium. He came. You know that, that in my vein flows the Spanish mixed with Roman blood. As incapable of fear as it is of weak emotion. When the Nazarene made his appearance, I was walking into my basilica and my feet seemed set, fastened with an iron hand to the marble pavement. And I trembled in every limb, as does a guilty culprit, though the Nazarene was as calm as innocence itself. When he came to me, he stopped, and by a signal sign, he seemed to say to me, I am here, though he spoke not a word. For some time, I contemplated with admiration and awe this extraordinary type of man. 
a type unknown to our numerous painters who have given form and figure to all the gods and the heroes. There was nothing about him that was repelling in his character, yet I felt too awed and tremulous to approach him. And uh, Bob's note here. Remember when it said that his uh, he had a golden colored hair? Well, read Revelation chapter 1, specifically verse 14, where it says his head and his hair were as white as wool, as white as snow. I just had a black Hebrew on Gab tell me, oh, well, yeah, Whitey took, took the Bible and rewrote it. Yeah, right. All right, let's continue reading. Jesus, I said unto him at last, and my tongue faltered. Jesus of Nazareth, for the last three years I have granted you ample freedom of speech, nor do I regret it. Your words are those of a sage. I know not whether you have read Socrates or Plato, but this I know, that there is in your discourses a majestic simplicity that elevates you far above those philosophers. The emperor is informed of it, and I, his humble representative in this country, am glad of having allowed you that liberty of which you are worthy. However, I must not conceal from you that your discourses have raised up against you powerful and inveterate enemies. Nor is this surprising. Socrates had his enemies and fell victim to, to, of their hatred. Yours are doubly incensed against you on account of your discourses. Being so severe upon their conduct against me on account of the liberty I have afforded you, they even accuse me of being indirectly leagued with you for the purpose of depriving the Hebrews of the little civil power which Rome has left them. My request, I do not say in order, is that you be more circumspect and moderate in your discourses in the future and more considerate of them lest you arouse the pride of your enemies and they raise against you the stupid populace and compel me to employ the instruments of law. Bob's note here. Tell me this doesn't sound, I mean, I don't know. Let's keep reading. The Nazarene calmly replied, Prince of the earth, your words, your words proceed not from true wisdom. Say to the torrent to stop in the midst of the mountain gorge, uh, talking about, you know, a flood of water. Uh, say to the torrent to stop in the midst of the mountain gorge, it will uproot the trees of the valley. The torrent will answer you that it obeys the law of nature and the creator. God alone knows whither the flows of the waters of the torrent. Verily I say unto you, before the rose of Sharon blossoms, the blood of the just shall be spilt. Your blood shall not be spilt, said I with deep emotion. You are more precious in my estima estimation on account of your wisdom than all the turbulent and proud Pharisees who abuse, who abuse the freedom granted them by the Romans. They conspire against Caesar and convert his bounty into fear, impressing the unlearned that Caesar is a tyrant and seeks their ruin. Insolent wretches, insolent wretches, they are not aware that the wolf of the Tiber sometimes clothes himself with the skin of sheep to accomplish his wicked designs. I will protect you against them. My praetorium shall be an asylum both day and night. That which is written in the books of the prophets must be accomplished. Jesus carelessly shook his head and said with a grave and divine smile, When the day shall come, there will be no asylums for the Son of Man, neither in the earth nor under the earth. The asylum of the just is there, pointing to the heavens. That which is written in the books of the prophets must be accomplished. Young man, I answered mildly, 
You will oblige me to convert my requests into an order. The safety of the province, which has been confided in my care, requires it. You must observe more moderation in your discourses. Do not infringe my order. You know the consequences. May happiness attend you. Farewell. I came not to bring war into the world, but peace, love, and charity. Prince of the earth, replied Jesus. I came not to bring war into the world, but peace, love, and charity. I was born the same day on which Augustus Caesar gave peace to the Roman world. Persecutions proceed not from me. I expect it from others, and I will meet it in obedience to the will of my Father, who has shown me the way. Restrain, therefore, your worldly prudence. It is not your power to arrest the victim at the foot at the foot of the tabernacle of uh, expiation, which uh, means the act of making amends or reparation for guilt or wrongdoing, atonement. Uh, so let's continue reading this. Uh, it, so Jesus said, it is not in your power to arrest the victim at the foot of the tabernacle of ex. Piation. So saying, he disappeared like a bright shadow behind the curtains of the basilica, to my great relief, for I felt a heavy burden on me, of which I could not relieve myself of in his presence. Jesus appeared to be one of those great philosophers that great nations sometimes produce. To Herod, when he reigned in Galilee, the enemies of Jesus addressed themselves to wreck their vengeance on the Nazarene. Had Herod consulted his own inclinations, he would have ordered Jesus immediately put to death. Oh, yeah. But though proud of his royal dignity, yet he hesitated to commit an act that might lessen his fluence, influence with the Senate, or like me, was afraid of Jesus. But it never, but it would never do for a Roman officer to be afraid of a Jew. Previously to this, Herod called on me at the Praetorium, and on rising to take leave after some trifling conversation, asked me what was my opinion concerning the Nazarene. I replied that Jesus appeared to me to be one of those great philosophers that great nations sometimes produced, that his doctrines were by no means sacrilegious, and that the intentions of Rome were to leave him to that freedom of speech which was justified by his actions. Herod smiled maliciously and, saluting me with ironical respect, departed. Bob's note here, it was Herod, the Herod family, that put up the money to uh, enlarge the temple where they were doing animal sacrifices. You know, when Jesus uh, went into the temple and uh, overthrew the tables and said, you know, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves, and then he whipped them. What would Jesus do? Uh, whip people? Yeah. Yeah, Herod was, uh, Herod didn't build the temple because he wanted to honor God. Herod uh, did that with the temple for control. That's what it was all about. Clamoring for the death of the Nazarene. The great feast of the Jews was approaching. Uh, this is Passover. The great feast of the Jews was approaching, and the intention was to avail themselves of the popular exultation, which always manifests itself at the solemnities of the Passover. The city was overflowing with a tumultuous populace clamoring for the death of the Nazarene. My emissaries informed me that the treasure of the temple had been employed in bribing the people. The danger was pressing. A Roman centurion had been insulted. I wrote to the prefect of Syria for a hundred foot soldiers and as many cavalry. 
He declined. I saw myself alone with a handful of veterans in the midst of a rebellious city, too weak to suppress an uprising and having no choice left but to tolerate it. They had seized upon Jesus and the seditious rabble, although they had nothing to fear from the praetorium, believing as their leaders had told them that I winked at their sedition, continued vociferating, Crucify him! Crucify him! Three powerful parties had combined together at that time against Jesus. First, the Herodians, you know, the family of Herod, and the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees were the temple Jews. They were the ones that did the animal sacrifice. They were like the Levites. Uh, first, the Herodians and the Sadducees, whose seditious conduct seemed to have proceeded from double motives. They hated the Nazarene and were impatient with the Roman yoke. They never forgave me for having entered the holy city with banners that bore the image of the Roman emperor. And although in this instance I had committed a fatal error, yet the sacrilege did not appear less heinous in their eyes. Another grievance also rankled in their bosoms. I had proposed to employ a part of the treasures of the temple in erecting edifices for public use. My proposal was scorned. The Pharisees were the avowed enemies of Jesus. They cared not for the government. They bore with bitterness the severe reprimands which the Nazarene for three years had been continually giving them wherever he went. Timid and too weak to act by themselves, they had embraced the quarrels of the Herodians and the Sadducees. Besides these three parties, I had to contend against the reckless and profligate populace. Boy, I use some big words here. Always ready to join sedition and profit by the disorder and confusion that resulted therefrom. Condemned to death. Jesus was dragged before the high priest and condemned to death. It was then that the high priest, Caiaphas, performed a divisory, D-I-V-I-S-O-R-Y, act of submission. He sent his prisoner to me to confirm his condemnation and secure his execution. I answered him that, as Jesus was a Galilean, the affair came under Herod's jurisdiction and ordered him to be sent thither. The wily tetriarch, Herod, professed humility and protesting his deference to the lieutenant of Caesar. He committed the fate of the man to my hands. Soon my palace assumed the aspect of a besieged citadel. Every moment increased the number of malcontents. Jerusalem was inundated with crowds from the mountains of Nazareth. All Judea appeared to be pouring into the city. Beware, beware, and touch not that man, for he is holy. I had taken a wife from among the Gauls. Uh, if you don't know who the Gauls were, uh, they were, uh, some say, uh, Galatia and uh, someday it's modern-day France. You ever heard of Charles de Gaulle? Yeah. I had taken a wife from among the Gauls who pretended to see into futurity. Weeping and throwing herself at my feet, she said to me, Beware, beware, and touch not that man, for he is holy. Last night I saw a vision. He was walking on the water. He was flying on the wings of the wind. He spoke to the tempest and to the fishes of the lake. All were obedient to him. Behold, the torrent of Mount Kidron flows with blood. The statues of Caesar, the statues of Caesar are filled with gemonside. The columns of the interium have given away and the sun is veiled in mourning like a vestal in the tomb. 
Ah, pilot, evil awaits thee, if thou wilt not listen to the vows of thy wife. Dread the curse of a Roman senate. Dread the frowns of Caesar. So here it is, she's saying, don't have anything to do with this, uh, anything bad to do with this guy. And if you want to read more about this in the Bible, Matthew 27, 19, And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife, Pilate, sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. I'm telling you, this letter is, it's like almost, reading the bible i mean really in a lot of ways all right let's continue by this time the marble stair groaned under the weight of the multitude the nazarene was brought back to me i proceeded to the halls of justice followed by my guard and asked the people in a severe tone what they demanded the death of the nazarene was the reply for what crime he blasphemed. He prophesied the ruin of the temple. He calls himself the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of the Jew. Roman justice, said I, punishes not such offenses with death. Crucify him! Crucify him! Cried the relentless rabble. The voicer, voiceferations of the infuriated mob shook the palace to his foundations. But there was one who appeared to be calm in the midst of the vast multitude. It was the Nazarene. After many fruitless attempts to protect him from the fury of his merciless prosecutors, I adopted a measure which at the moment appealed, appeared to me to be the only one that could save his life. I proposed a measure as it was their custom to deliver a prisoner on such occasions to release Jesus and let him go free that he might be the scapegoat as they called it. But they said Jesus must be crucified. I then spoke to them of the inconsistency of their course as being incompatible with their laws, showing that no criminal judge could pass sentence on a criminal unless he had fasted one whole day and that the sentence must have the consent of the Sanhedrin and the signature of the president of that court, that no criminal could be executed on the same day. His sentence was fixed, and the next day on the day of his execution, the Sanhedrin was required to review the whole proceeding. Also, according to their law, a man was stationed at the door of the court with a flag, and another a short way off on horseback to cry the name of the criminal and his crime and the name of his witnesses, and to know if anyone could testify in his favor. And the prisoner on his way to execution had the right to turn back three times and to plead any new thing in his favor. I urged all these pleas, hoping they might all them into subjection, but they cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! I then called for a basin and washed my hands. People, that's right out of the Bible. Jesus washed his hands and uh, said, "I'm my hands are clean of the blood of this man. I then called for a basin and washed my hands. I then ordered Jesus to be scourged, hoping this might satisfy them, but it only increased their fury. I then called for a basin and washed my hands in the presence of the clamorous multitude Thus testifying in my judgment, Jesus of Nazareth had done nothing deserving of death, but in vain. It was his life these wretches thirsted for. Often, in our civil commotions, have I witnessed the furious anger of the multitude, but nothing, nothing could be compared with what I witnessed on this occasion. It might have been truly said that all the phantoms of the infernal regions had assembled at Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what he's saying here, he's saying all the demons from hell gathered together. Yeah, they did. 
The crowd appeared not to walk, but to be borne off and whirled as a vortex, rolling along in living waves from the portals of the Praetorium, even unto Mount Zion, with howling screams, sheik, shrieks, shrieks, and vociferations, such as were never heard in the seditions of the Pannonia or in the tumults of the Forum. By degrees, the day darkened like a winter's twilight, such as had been at the death of the great Julius Caesar. It was likewise the Ides of March. I, the continued governor of a rebellious province, was leaning against a column of my basilica, contemplating at thwart the dreary gloom these fiends of Tartarus. Uh, if you don't know what Tartarus is, Tartarus is the... Uh, same Greek word in the New Testament for uh, the deepest abyss of hell. Tartarus, the deepest abyss of hell. These fiends of Tartarus dragging to execution the innocent Nazarene. All around me was deserted. Jerusalem had vomited forth her indwellers through the funeral gates that leads to Gemonica. An air of desolation and sadness enveloped me. My guards had joined the cavalry and the centurion with a distressed play of power was endeavoring to keep order. I was left alone and my breaking heart admonished me that what was passing at that moment appertained rather to the history of the gods than that of men. A loud clamor was heard proceeding from Golgotha. Golgotha, the place of the skull. Uh, a loud clamor was heard proceeding from Golgotha, which, borne on the wind, seemed to announce an agony such as was never heard by mortal ears. Dark clouds lowered over the pinnacle of the temple, and setting over the city, covered it as with a veil. A dark cloud. So dreadful were the signs that men saw both in the heavens and on the earth, but that Dionysius... The Aerophagite is reported to have exclaimed, either the author of nature is suffering or the universe is falling apart. Whilst these appalling scenes of nature were transpiring, there was a dreadful earthquake in Lower Egypt which filled everybody with fear and scared the superstitious Jews almost to death. It is said Balthasar, an aged and learned Jew of Antioch, was found dead after the excitement was over. Whether he died from alarm or grief is not known. He was a strong friend of the Nazarene. The sacrifice was consummated near the first hour of the night. I threw my mantle around me and went down into the city toward the gates of Golgotha, the sacrifice was consummated. The crowd was returning home, still agitated, it is true, but gloomy, taciturn, and desperate. What they had witnessed had stricken them with terror and remorse. What they had witnessed had stricken them with terror and remorse. I also saw my little Roman cohort pass by mournfully, the standard bearer having veiled his eagle, eagle in token of grief, and I overheard some of the Jewish soldiers murmuring strange words which I did not understand. Others were recounting miracles, very like those which have so often smitten the Romans by the will of gods. Sometimes groups of men and women would halt, remain motionless in expectation of witnessing some new progeny. They all sunk off like cowardly curs. Uh, a cur is a, a mangy dog. I returned to the praetorium and sad and pensive on ascending the stairs, the steps of which were still stained with the blood of the Nazarene. I perceived an old man in a supp suppliant posture and behind him several Romans in tears. He threw himself at my feet and wept most bitterly. 
It is painful to see an old man weep and my heart being already overcharged. You know, you can read right in the Bible, uh, for example, Matthew 27, verse 44, The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in their, his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness, darkness over all the land unto the sixth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard it, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. You know, here it is, Jesus is speaking, and they don't even understand what they're saying. He's saying. But people today want you to think, oh yeah, Hebrew, it's it's a living language. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't, they didn't even understand what he was saying 2,000 years ago. You think they understand today? No, I don't think so. And straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. This is the kind of stuff that Pilate is writing about. So, now if you want to read what we're getting ready to read, John 19, 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Matthew 27, 58. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. There you go. So, let's keep reading. It is painful to see an old man weep, and my heart being already overcharged with grief, we, those strangers, wept together, and in truth it seemed that the tears lay very shallow that day, with many whom I perceived in the vain, disc, uh, vain I'm sorry, in the vast concourse of people. I never witnessed such an extreme revulsion of feeling. Those who betrayed and sold him, those who testified against him, those who cried, "Crucify him! We have his blood!" all slunk off like cowardly curs and washed their teeth with vinegar. As I am told that Jesus taught a resurrection and a separation after his, uh, and a separation after death. If such be the fact, I am sure it commenced in this vast crowd. Father, I said to him, after gaining control of my feelings, who are you and what is your request? I am Joseph of Arimathea, replied he. I am come to beg of you upon bended knees the permission to bury Jesus of Nazareth. Your prayer is granted, I said to him, and ordered men, many Lewis to take some soldiers with him to superintend the interment, lest it should be profaned. A few days after, the sepulcher was found empty. His Disciples proclaimed all over the country that Jesus had risen from the dead as he had foretold. This created more excitement even than the crucifixion. And to its truth, I cannot say for certain, but I have made some investigation of the matter. So you can examine for yourself, see if I am in fault, as Herod represents. Joseph buried Jesus in his own tomb. Whether he contemplated his resurrection or calculated to cut him another, I cannot tell. The day after he was buried, one of the priests came to the praetorium and said they were apprehensive that his disciples intended to steal the body of Jesus and hide it, and then make it appear that he had risen from the dead, as he had foretold, and of which they were perfectly convinced I sent him to the captain of the royal guard to tell him to take the Jewish soldiers and place as many around the sepulcher 
as were needed, then if anything should happen, they could blame themselves and not the Romans. And if you read in the Bible, Bob's note here, if you read in the Bible, it says that the, uh, uh, the it was Jewish soldiers, not the Romans, that uh, they were, they would say that, well, we were asleep and the disciples came and stole the body. Well, if you were asleep, how would you know that the disciples came and stole the body? And by the way, uh, why would you do that? Why would you steal the body to, to lift up Jesus for a lie? And then when the Jews said, all right, uh, if you don't tell us where the body is, we're going to kill you. Uh, wouldn't you. Wouldn't you produce the body to save your life? Of course you would. Uh, Josh McDowell wrote an excellent book called Jesus, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord. should read it. It's not real small, you know. It's not real big. Was Jesus a liar? Was he insane? Or is he Lord? So, take the Jewish soldiers and place as many around the sepulcher as were needed. Then if anything should happen, they could blame themselves and not the Romans. When the great excitement arose about the sepulcher being empty, I felt a deeper uh, solicitude than ever. I sent for Malsius, who told me he had placed his lieutenant, Ben Isham, with 100 soldiers around the sepulcher. He told me that Isham and the soldiers were very much alarmed at what had occurred there that morning. I sent for this man, Isham, who related to me as, nar as near as I can recollect the following circumstances. He said that at the beginning of the fourth watch, he saw a beautiful all right, so he said that at the beginning, at about the beginning of the fourth watch, he saw a soft and beautiful light over the sepulcher. He at first thought the woman had come to embalm the body of Jesus, as was her custom, but he could not see how they had gotten through the guards. While these thoughts were passing through his mind, behold, the whole place was lighted up, and there seemed to be crowds of the dead in their grave clothes. All seemed to be shouting and filled with ecstasy, while all around and above was the most beautiful music he had ever heard, and the whole air seemed to be full of voices praising God. Full of voices praising God. At this time, there seemed to be a reeling and swimming of the earth, so that he turned so sick and faint that he could not stand on his feet. He said the earth seemed to swim from under him, and his senses left him so that he knew not what did occur. I asked him if he could not have been mistaken as to the light. Was it not day that was coming in the east? He said at first he thought of that, but at a stone's cast it was exceeding dark, and then he remembered it was too early for day. I asked him if his dizziness might not have come from being awakened and getting up too suddenly, as it sometimes had that effect. He said he was not and had not been asleep all night, as the penalty was death for him to sleep on duty. That's right. You didn't want to get caught sleeping on duty uh, when you're in the army, especially the Roman army. Uh, penalty was death. If you were tired, you better walk around. He said he had let some of the soldiers sleep at a time. Some were asleep then. I asked him how long the scene lasted. He said he did not know, but he thought it was nearly an hour. He said it was hid by the light of the day. I asked him if he went to the sepulcher after, uh, after he had come to himself. He said no, because he was afraid that just as soon as relief came, they were all they all went to their quarters. I asked him if he had been questioned by the priests. He said he had. They wanted him, him to say it was an earthquake and that there were that they were asleep and offered him money to say that the disciples came and stole Jesus. But we saw no disciples. He did not know the body was gone until he was told. I asked him what was the private opinion of those priests he had conversed with. He said that some of them thought that Jesus was no man, 
that he was not a human being, that he was not the son of Mary, that he was not the same that was said to be born of the virgin in Bethlehem, that the same person had been on earth before with Abraham and Lot and at many times and places. It seemed to me that if the Jewish theory were true, these conclusions are correct. For they are in accord with this man's life, as is known and testified by both friends and foes. For the elements were no more in his hands than the clay in the hands of the potter. He could convert water into wine. He could change death into life, disease into health. He could calm the seas, still the storms, call up fish with a silver coin in its mouth. Now I say... If he could do all these things, which he did, and many more, as the Jews all testify. And it was doing these things that created this enmity against him, the hatred. He was not charged with criminal offenses, nor was he charged with violating any law, nor any wrongdoing, any, wrongdoing, any individual in person. And all these facts are known to thousands as well by his foes, as by his friends. I am almost ready to say, as did Manlius at the cross, truly this was the Son of God. Now, noble sovereign, this is as near the facts in the case as I can arrive at, and I have taken pains to make the statement very full, so that you may judge of my conduct upon the whole, as I hear Antipater has said many hard things of me in this matter. With the promise of faithfulness and goodness wishes with the promise of faithfulness and good wishes my noble sovereign I am your obedient servant Pontius Pilate Antipater was just another ruler in another area so all right well that is uh, that's the end take it with a grain of salt take the whole salt shaker you know uh, hit it lines up with history. It lines up with the Bible. So, is it true? I don't know. All righty. Take care. All blessing, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.